I'm Max from Dropbox. I'm an SRE, and uh, this is Peter. He is uh, my SQL SRE. And uh, today we'll speak about optimizing MySQL without touching SQL or my.cnf. And there is a funny reason why we call that this way, because before joining Dropbox here and a half ago, I never touched MySQL. I was mostly like Postgres guy. And uh, I was never DBA. So I have no idea how to optimize MySQL by touching my.cnf. And uh, that's a small preamble. And let's take a look what is a Dropbox today. And Dropbox is a file storage, as you know. And uh, we really at big scale. We have 1.2 billion files saved and uploaded to Dropbox every day. Uh, we have like 500 million customers and 200,000 business customers. And uh, that actually leads to one interesting problem that we want to be more efficient. And uh, by more efficient, I mean we want uh, to serve user requests faster. Uh, we, want, uh, we want to save on power because we have like many, many servers, thousands of them. And uh, power costs in data centers, they are significant. And uh, we want actually to use and buy less new hardware because we have natural growth. And uh, for that, uh, we are actually looking at how to optimize our databases because it's a big and significant part of our storage. And uh, let's start from like trivial things like less level optimizations. It's our today focus on our talk is not about less level optimizations, but uh, I need to mention that that your production, like and our production uh, hardware is highly optimized. Uh, and, uh, we have like lots of OS level optimizations. But when I started first iteration of pre to prepare for my talk, I actually did not check that my test machine has the same settings as production machine. And uh, one of the settings that was missing is like CPU frac uh, governor, which uh, controls how much power I give to CPU. And it was set to power safe. And I was a bit disappointed when I started benchmarks. Like, OK, crap. <laughs> I, I, can't, uh, I can't do the talk anymore. So actually, yeah, you need to, to synchronize your uh, test environment settings the same as you have in production, so you're not disappointed in that. And you need to set uh, governing to be performance. And that's probably enough about the uh, level optimization, just like interesting thing. So what's going on when, when you're just uh, running MySQL D in production you're probably interested what is it, what is it actually doing. And we have two friends, like S-Trace. It shows you which syscalls your MySQL D does. And you have perf. You can actually analyze where MySQL D spends time. And uh, this leads to an interesting example. How many of you know what is a TCP wrapper library? OK, a few people. So TCP wrapper library was written by Dutch computer scientist uh, Witze Venema in 1990. And basically, it provides host-based networking ACLs. And uh, I should notice that it is not the same as MySQL ACLs. It doesn't verify credentials, especially it doesn't verify the host part in MySQL credentials. It is similar to what, in modern days, uh, IP tables provide you. It just checks that client connection can be established from this particular host or not. And if it's not, it just drops the connection. And uh, it's actually the example where s -trace comes handy. Uh, so a bit, uh, more, a bit more about how LibRop works. You probably saw that in etc directory you have uh, host.allow, host.deny. And uh, uh, LibRop actually verifies that client specified in deny can't connect, like who the host can connect to this particular machine, or it can connect. And uh, running S-Trace, just, it's just some example of S-Trace output on of one, our internal database. It's not very high loaded. But we, we ran S-Trace for, like for a minute. And uh, how many of these syscalls are made by Librop? This one. So actually what it does on every connection, on every accept, it opens two files, etc.host.allow.deny. 
It uh, mmaps them to memory, it checks fstat if the file actually changed. It al also calls get soc name, get peer name to, to just get the data, and it closes afterwards. So actually, these are two and a half percent of syscalls, and uh, that's actually tens of thousands context switchers per second doing useless works, useless work because we are, we are familiar with IP tables or using IP tables, but uh, Debian packages provided by distribution, they're compiled with LibreOp and you can't disable LibreOp in runtime, you need to recompile. And that's one of the examples why you want to rebuild MySQLD, for example, just to disable and uh, avoid these uh, needed context switches. Uh, another thing like fast mutases, they're really fast. And uh, fast, fast mutases is a mutex implementation in MySQL 5.6. And uh, I should definitely like, notice that MySQL has two mutex implementations. One of them called is fast mutex, and another one is in a DB mutex. And Peter Zaitsev had really nice talk about in DB internals yesterday. And he mentioned that in DB mutexes, they're highly optimized. They're really fast. And actually, that's not the case for fast mutexes. And uh, let's take a look like what is a just regular general mutex implementation. Usually in modern like Linux, uh, mutexes are implemented as a spin log and a futex. A futex is just a user space mutex implementation provided by kernel. So, and mutex is usually implemented using uh, atomic operations. And taking a look at uh, how mutex is implemented, uh, five mutex is implemented in MySQL, it is just spin log, trying to acquire spin log for some number of iterations, and uh, after that, falling back to p thread mutex, which in turn does the same, it is implemented the same way, it just does spin logs and uh, fallbacks to futex. But the problem is not that it has two spin logs, spin log loops, the problem is that fast mutex implementation in MySQL, and we're speaking about MySQL 5.6, is not efficient. Like dis disregarding the code style differences between NPTL, which is a POSIX thread, uh, POSIX mutexes, and fast mutex implementation, there's a significant difference in implementation. Every loop, when spin logs just delays uh, next retry, it, it does three assembly operations store, load, and increment. And in PTL just does atomic spin knob, and Intel actually suggests to do knob or pause, which actually will uh, tell CPU to do nothing. And uh, fast mutex implementation will actually uh, occupy CPU execu execution port, and as far as you know that CPU has limited number of executions, it, it can execute limited number of operations per cycle. And uh, that's actually a difference, like another difference in fast mutex is that uh, the number of uh, spins uh, is produced by PRNG, see the random number generator, and PRNG uses floating point arithmetics, which is also not very fast. And actually, it, yeah, it utilizes CPU execution port. Unlike that, NPTL actually emits NOP and POSE instruction, and uh, NPTL is actually highly optimized by Intel and AMD engineers, and not, they know what they're doing. And it actually uses adaptive number of spins, and kernel, modern kernels, like Linux or even Solaris, they provide the counters how many, how many spins your spin log should do so you don't have much log contention, or you need to just fall back to Futex. And uh, that's interesting thing that we start measuring with Perf, like we started thinking about like, where actually MySQL spends time. And we found out that actually MySQL spends one and a half percent of uh, CPU time just uh, trying to acquire spin lock and doing all these uh, unneeded operations. So gladly this was fixed and by Oracle in 5.7.8. And I really love these comments in the ticket. Pretending that we can implement fast mutexes with such a simple code is so just naive, and labeling that as fast mutex without any evidence is misleading to our users. And they just removed the uh, fast mutex implementation completely, and that now they're using pthread 
Mutex is. And uh, it is actually quite easy if you're using 5.6, it's just easy to backport that patch. You, you can just uh, uh, jump directly to pthread mutex lock and uh, you can save like one and a half or two, two percent of CPU time. So that's small another preamble for what we are doing in Dropbox and uh, when you're doing code changes or you're just rebuilding MySQL D, you, need, you, you can't do just blind changes. You need to run benchmarks so in, you know that your changes there actually have some effect or like bad or good. And for that we're using Sysbench and uh, I really like Sysbench, it's a really nice tool, nicely written tool. And uh, especially after 1.0 was released uh, earlier this year, it's a scriptable uh, multi-threaded benchmark tool and ba it's based on Logit and writing Lu is fun. Uh, and it provides a collection of LTP database benchmarks. It also provides like IO, disk IO, CPU benchmarks, but right now we're more interested in OTP benchmarks. And uh, that's how we ran Sysbench for, uh, for these benchmarks. Uh, we ran that uh, variable number of threads uh, from 1 to 128. We uh, set up our test database of 64 tables, 1 million rows each. And uh, we ran each test for five minutes, and we benchmarked. So let's think. Let's take a look at our production environment. And in production, we're running 1604, Ubuntu 16.04, and these are compilers available in 16.04. It's just GCC 4.9, 5.4, and Clang 3.8. So yeah, it sounds like fun. Just let's rebuild, and uh, modern compilers they are good, and uh, we will have some speed ups. And that's not the case for 5.4 and 5.3. We have actually in performance degradations. We didn't take a look why that happens. And we were just uh, happy that actually in, to show an example that taking modern compilers like Clang 3.8 comparing through to 4.9 actually improves performance. And uh, here, I know how. So, we, we took as a baseline, we took a GC 4.9, it's exactly the compiler version we used in 12.04 in previous Ubuntu version. And uh, it's shown as a green line here. We'll take it as a baseline for every other benchmark in this talk. And uh, we have a, a GC 4.4 as a blue line, it's, it, it performs really bad. Uh, and uh, Clank is a red one. This graph particularly is uh, for throughput. So how many QPS per, per queries per second you can perform on the same uh, hardware setup. And uh, these are graphs for latencies. So we see again that uh, Clank, like modern compilers, they can generate much more efficient uh, or a little bit more efficient code. And uh, we can benefit just from rebuilding. But that's not it. Like just re rebuilding is not fun. And uh, there is an interesting advanced optimization technique in modern compilers called profile guided optimizations. And how that basically works, you're building instrumented binary which starts collecting data, starts collecting profiling data like uh, function calls, branch, uh, uh, branching statistics. So using that profiling data, a compiler can actually optimize and uh, relocate code parts like to avoid branch misprediction, to to avoid uh, cache line, uh, po like false positive cache line. And uh, there's a common mistake. People are starting collecting profile data on unit tests, and that's actually bad because compiler starts optimizing for corner cases and you don't want to optimize for exceptions. You want to optimize for normal workload. And uh, in order to build instrumented binary in both uh, Clank and GCC, you can use special flag uh, fprofile generate. It starts collecting profile data. And uh, when you collected enough data, you can just rebuild it again with uh, fprofile use. And there is a notion that GCC additionally requires fprofile correction because MySQL D is a multi threaded uh, application, so counters could be not very reliable. And GCC makes the best effort to correct that. And there is a notion that PGO usually requires to rebuild binary, but that's not always the case, and I'll mention that a bit later. So we took uh, 
PGO build, and we start the compiler, campaign, comparing GC 4.9 and GC 5.4. And uh, if you remember that 5.4, just regular 5.4, behaved really bad previously. But with PGO, it actually outperforms 4.9. It's actually faster, and the difference is a bit like 10, 15%, which is really good. You're just rebuilding, collecting data, and you have 10, 15% more throughput. And uh, latencies, they are also reducing. So that's about PGO, and uh, there's a tool from Google. I mentioned before that it usually requires rebuilding binary, but it's not always the case. Google wrote auto FDO tool, which helps you to convert perf data. You can just start uh, collecting perf data on a production machine, and uh, having the same binary, you can just rebuild uh, source code using that perf data, and auto FDO works with both GCC and Clank and helps you to convert uh, perf data into profiling data, so you can just rebuild that. And I should notice that uh, instrumented binaries, they're usually much, much slower than optimized binaries. They, they might be like 100 times slower than your production binary, so you don't need, it's better not to put instrumented binary into production. You'll just ruin your business. So, uh, Auto FDO, it's, it's almost as efficient as building instrumented binaries. It has like maybe a couple of percent difference. Still like collecting profiling data is better, but if you don't want to put uh, instrumented binary into production, it's uh, actually a good option. And uh, it requires LBR support, last branch record, uh, from both CPU and kernel. And uh, depending on the kernel you're using in production, it might require you rebuilding kernel. And uh, regular perf just works well. You can, you can just use regular perf, or if you're using perf-b, it's even better. It produces like, just better statistics for branching. And uh, that's about PGO. So another advanced optimization technique is link time optimizations. And it's also known as full program optimizations. And what it does is uh, what, how compilers are generally built binaries. They're building and optimizing inside of translation units, that means like inside of your C or .c, .c or .c, .cpp file, and they usually can't inline functions from different translation units. But LTO enables this option, and how it works, compilers, instead of emitting binary code on compilation time, they're emitting intermediate representation, and actual compilation and optimization happens in linker front end. So linker sees uh, the whole program and can inline functions from different translation units. And this way, it can actually produce much faster and uh, smaller binary sizes. Uh, but it's not always the case because uh, at the same time, compiler doesn't know your production workload. And uh, in our case, like LTO just a bit worse than uh, just uh, using regular optimized with all three binary. And uh, latency are also not very impressive. But I should, I should notice that, yeah, we definitely, we uh, didn't compare to Clank, we didn't provide Clank benchmarks for this PGO and LTO, and there is a reason why. First reason, if you're using just regular Ubuntu Debian packages, uh, Maintainers just forgot to include LTO plugin for Clang, so you don't have you have broken symlink. And uh, if you if you take uh, Clang 3.9 4.0 from LLVM Debian packages, it builds, it works, but it crashes on MySQL D crashes on any DDL changes. So basically, we 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 check that it, it is able to build with LTO, but uh, we can't use that results. But Bad results are also results, right? So uh, another optimizations available in compilers, and lots of people are forgetting about that, is uh, native instruction sets. And by default, compilers, and we're, we're mostly, like on servers, we're running only x86-64 architecture. Most compilers, they're just emitting the code, which is generic for K8, K8 instruction set. And K8 was uh, created and released by AMD in 2000, like 70 years ago. And since then, 
uh, CPU manufacturers, they, they released many more advanced uh, and modern instruction sets, which help in some cases. And to, to start using native instruction set or to start using any other instruction set from K8, you can provide mArch and mTune to compiler. It will start emitting uh, the code which is uh, optimized for your CPU architecture. You can replace actually native. Native just builds for your current uh, hardware you're building on, but if you have like different uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, hardware, you can specify like Broadwell or Haswell or Skylake, and you can build for least architecture you have. And uh, native instruction sets, they actually help in MySQL D case. They, they give you more throughput. They, they give you lower latencies. And uh, yeah, that makes sense to build a native instruction set. So another thing, like we can combine these optimization techniques. And we can combine PGO plus LTO. And you remember that previously LTO did not optimize. Well, we didn't have good results with LTO, just regular LTO. But if you combine uh, LTO and PGO, and on this graph, these are blue, they are outperform just PGO. And here we have like 35% uh, throughput improvement. And it's really good. You can combine like, you, you have uh, latency decreases as well. And even more, you can combine with native instruction sets. And it outperforms a bit more. So now we have uh, up to 40% throughput. And you have lower latencies. So these optimization techniques, they actually make sense. You, you need to do that in production if you want to, to use your hardware more efficiently. But there is an interesting thing that these are all not real world examples. These are not real world scenarios because we're in sys bench. And optimizing for sys bench can actually lead to that your binary in production would be slower, that for example, you're not uh, collecting data for your slave replication and your slave replication can, can be much, much slower. And there's it's actually an example where uh, Precorn Career Playback comes handy, and we, we actually invested lots of time this year to improve playback. And here I will pass uh, the word to Peter, who was leading the project. So. Thanks. So, uh, I don't know, it, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, like Maxim said, you know, we see, we see from the SysBench benchmarks that this is definitely worth investigating, right? Just with rebuilding MySQL, 30-40% performance increase is nice, right? And also the latency drop. But in production, Dropbox doesn't run SysBench on thousands of servers, so we need a way to optimize on our workload in, instead of SysBench. Like Max said that you need to run the workload on an instrumented binary, and the instrumented binary is really slow, like really, really slow, even slower. Like 1,000 QPS from instrumented binary is pretty good. So um, we need to reproduce our workload reliably on these slow instrumented binaries. And workload reproduction also allows us to answer very hard questions like, you know, what happens if we use machines with half the memory? Who knows the question for that, for their, their environment? What is the actual performance impact if they would just half the memory? Or lower it by 10% or something, right? These are really hard questions. And without workload reproduction, it's even harder to answer. Like one easy way to answer this is just put the put the uh, machine with decreased memory in production, but then if it hurts, it hurts, it hurts the business. So the goal of this is to recreate the original workload offline based on slow logs. So in order to capture a workload, you have to use a couple of slow, uh, slow log options. And some of these are only available in Percona server. So if you want to use playback, you have to use Percona server. That, that's it. This is how a slow log event looks like. The most important thing is 
uh, is the first two, slow query log use timestamp always and slow query log timestamp precision microsecond because this puts uh, this, so right uh, above user host, it puts this time, uh, time row on top of every event. So for every slow log event, we have the correct timing. And how playback works is that it takes the slow log and whenever it encounters a new MySQL thread ID, this is the MySQL thread ID in the, in the slow log event. So this is the slow log event for a single query. The play, played back work, uh, workload will just open up a new connection to the, to the MySQL server. And whatever was on this thread ID in the original workload will be played back on, on the opened thread ID in the played back workload. Right? So this means that playback uh, will have the parallelism of the original workload. So the or most of the original workload have a, have a variable parallelism. If, so parallelism is not static in real life workload. It's a function of time and playback can reproduce it. Uh, you could see that, uh, that this slow log is from edge store. Edge store is our, uh, is our general purpose database and you can learn more about edge store in just the next session. So shameless plug for one of our other talks. So every thread ID in the slow log opens up a new connection. And for each client con connection, playback will enqueue queue that number of statements to replay. Queue that by default is one. So how it works is there is a main like dispatcher thread which reads all the slow logs. The dispatcher thread will have many events and it dispatches the the events to play back for the, for the thread level, uh, for, the, for the actual play, played back threads. And this queue that tells that at the level of the playback thread, I want to enqueue at most one event. And this is how it retains, uh, how it retains the ordering characteristics of the original workload. By the way, ordering will never be perfect or most likely never be perfect, but uh, we, have, we have pretty good, good results about ke keeping ordering. And if you enable, uh, if you increase queue depth, it means that you allow more parallelism than the original workload at the cost of screwing up ordering more. So, what issues playback had? First, it leaked connections. Uh, one quick poll, who tried playback? Who tried Percona playback before? Who says it doesn't work? So there were, there were lots of feedback. I used to work at Percona, so I, I'm really biased about this. There were lots of feedback that it doesn't actually work. And there were lots of feedback that it doesn't actually work because how it works. So the first complaint was it, that it leaks connections, which was totally true. So whenever it encounters a new thread ID, it will play back everything on that, on that uh, given playback thread ID, but it will so much play back everything on that thread that even the administrative comment quit is how, you know, the quit event in the slow log is how it closes the thread. So if the slow log didn't have a quit event, which means that you know, the workload is like extremely well behaving and most of the workloads are not extremely well behaving, right? That they are always closing their, own, their connections gracefully. Like imagine if, for example, the PHP interpreter died which ran the thing, then you would never have a quit event in the slow log. So practically any kind of non-synthetic workload did leak connections. Uh, it often run into lock weights. The, the other complaint was that it often runs into lock weights and seems to do nothing. This was an issue with ordering. So imagine that in your workload, if you have select for update and update, if you, if you switch the order of these, like do the update and then do the select for update, that would still be a totally valid workload from the database perspective, but what it will do is that it will wait on the select for update blocking other transactions afterwards. 
So this was, a, this was an ordering issue. And another complaint was that output is unreadable and debugging was next to impossible, which is true. Like, whenever I run playback, I just redirected all output to devno. It, so. And uh, we fixed all of these. So uh, the enhancements we, we did is no more correction leak, the, the ordering is correct, and we added an accurate mode for playback. And uh, let me take some time to say kudos to Marius Watchler, who is our former, um, former colleague in Dropbox Dublin. He, uh, he was a member of uh, the Piston team, which is a JIT compiler from, f for Python, but joined us for a while. Um, and he did, he, he actually uh, wrote all the code for this, all the C++ code. And he is bicycling from Austria to Australia now. So he's working on different stuff right now. So um, this is an example of how you would use playback. And yeah, a couple of more words on correct ordering. So in, the slow log, in a slow log event, a slow log is, full of, is a file full of these. Like you have the query, you have the thing. And how this log is written is that at the very end uh, of the query, MySQL has a thread state logging slow query. So the order of queries in the slow log will be the order of the end of the queries. But that's not the order you should replay in what you should use for replay. Because if you want to reproduce the original workload, you have to replay based on the beginning order. And this is why it's important to use these options. So we have these for every single event. Because uh, how, we fixed, uh, how we fixed ordering issue is that there is a sorting step at the very beginning, which just sorts the events in the order they should be played back in the slow log. And then, uh, and then it, it will just play them back. So uh, example, the options in red are new. Disable, error report, disable reporting plugin error report. So the issue with error reporting plugin is that it's too verbose. For example, you will have errors like statement and the SQL took 143 nanoseconds instead of the original 152, which you know, probably you don't really care, <laughs> care much about that. So we pretty much always run it like this. Uh, ignore row results, uh, result diffs is, turns off another type of error report, which is pretty frequent, that uh, you, know, you have the different results for queries. This is mostly an issue if you are using a queue depth which is greater than one. And we also implemented MySQL max retries. Earlier, this was just a hash mark defined with, with a default of 10. So whenever you had a query which was unsuccessful, playback retried it 10 times. And the reason for playing sto playback stalling and seem seeming, uh, seemingly not doing anything is that if you run into an ordering issue with locking, like with select for update, you run into it 10 times, always. So in ODB lock wait timeout, uh, you don't wait it uh, only once, but 10 times. And now this is configurable. And in most cases, this may, it makes sense to set it to zero. OK. And also, we uh, added accurate mode. So but the playback's default mode is as fast as it can. Like it takes the slow log, it sorts it, it plays back given the original concurrency. But if you have an hour worth of workload with keeping the original concurrency, um, it can take an hour to play back, it can take more time, it can take less time or, because if something is ready to play back, it will play back. But most of the, 
most of the workloads have pauses in between them, right? So it happens that we have a connection, for example, and query one starts at time t, but query two starts at t plus five seconds, but query one was only one second originally. If you don't use accurate mode, query two will start right after query one is finished. If, if we are using accurate mode, if query one was one second originally and it is played back in 0 0.8, playback will wait 4.2 seconds to playback query two. So the accurate mode is for more accurately reproducing the original workload, even with the timing constraints. If query one was one second originally and played back in two seconds, playback will, uh, playback will wait uh, three seconds before starting query two. I have, a, I have an error in the slide. And if query one was one second originally and was played back in six seconds, query two will start immediately. So of course there is no like negative correction. So if there is a gap, if it makes sense to reproduce the gap, it will reproduce it, otherwise uh, it will start right away. So tips for larger Q depth, using larger Q depth, right? So the default non-accurate mode is playing back the workload as fast as possible. Increasing the Q depth means playback faster than possible, which means that, okay, I don't care about ordering. I just want to, I just want to play it back. Uh, even, even at the, at the expense of sacrificing the, the orders, right? So imagine that in, with Q depth one, if the dispatcher, dispatcher stalls, because it has to dispatch an event to a thread which already has one, with a Q depth greater than zero, in that case the dispatcher won't stall, but dispatch more and more events. So if you have a bottleneck in the workload, uh, the, uh, all the other threads will build up, uh, build up a queue which they can play back. So we don't stop uh, on, anything, on anything slow on the original workload, but, uh, but this, this is guaranteed to have ordering issues. Like there will be errors. For some workloads which Things. Which workload is, you know, when the workloads are relatively independent, like, I don't know, for example, if you have a social networking site and users doing, doing stuff totally independently, then probably increasing the queue depth is fine and the workload won't be affected too much, right? Uh, another useful thing is use session in init query to reduce InnoDB lock wait timeouts for playback threads. So when using playback, um, session with, with the session init query option, you can, uh, you can pass like initial SQL statements to run on each thread. And there is a new MySQL filter error option which uh, expects a regular expression, and it just filters out those errors you specify here from the output. Yeah. We are also hiring, and it's the end of the presentation. Questions? Yeah? Um, why you use as baseline for the first uh, part? Why you use the baseline 5.4, which was uh, worse in the original case? As a baseline, we're using. Hello. So for baseline, we're using 4.9. So I mean, for there are no for 4.9 with PGL, so it just doesn't support it, or there are some other reasons. So uh, yes, there are issues with. Uh, so 4.9 is like really old compiler. I don't know. It's maybe like six, seven years now, and the LTO and PGO support is much worse. And uh, for LTO. Uh, as far as I remember, 4.9 can't build MySQL D if uh, PGO and so on. Mo mostly the, the problem is that. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, uh, you s there was a slide that you said that there's a tool that converts perf uh, data to uh, format suitable for PGO, right? Yep. Have you compared uh, perf data, uh, perf, uh, profile data 
propeller data collected this way with the propeller data compared by queries to return station. So if you run here from production, get profile, convert it, uh, and how it compares, how the binary, uh, how it compares with the binary compiled with propeller data co uh, collected on the uh, this is match result. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's a point of uh, auto F FDO tool that you can collect data in production and to build no, and. I mean, uh, have you tried to, to do both and compare both options and to figure out what, what's what better? So yeah, if you collect data using auto FDO in production and build the optimized binary and will test it with sys bench benchmarks, the data collected from sys bench benchmarks. Uh, it's just better. Oh, so of course, of course, the one uh, if you collect the data in production, it it, it shows uh, better results, because you are optimizing for your workload. Uh, replaying data with, with query playback. Yeah, so, so the, the difference between auto FDO is like just a couple of percents, but uh, just replaying data is better than just collecting data because uh, you, you just uh, have more statistics uh, from profiling. It can also answer the other questions, like what will happen if I have the memory? What's the impact of, my, uh, of faster storage on my workload, right? Compile custom MySQL. Why don't you compile uh, custom compilers? So, like, why do you stick with uh, whatever Ubuntu provides? Yeah, we, we can we can all definitely do that. Just uh, we are not uh, yeah, investing right now much into compilers. Yeah, definitely, and. Uh, just right now, we're not investing that much in compilers, but uh, in just near well, future, we'll, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, of course, it, it makes sense to take uh, modern compilers because uh, Clank, for example, they, they're bundled with uh, LLD, new linker, which uh, just links much faster. And uh, yeah, MySQL D just uh, not that big binary, but if you have like really huge uh, binaries, uh, linking time could be significant. If you can parallelize compilation step, you can't parallelize uh, linking until you're using GOAT or uh, LLD. More questions? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.